Uh, welcome, uh, everybody, to the special Quantum World uh, the TV. Uh, we uh, apologize for this uh, uh, technical inconvenient. And, and today is a very special day because we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Eric Pearl, uh, who is uh, very known in the field of uh, quantum medicine. I would say he's, not, uh, he's more than a pioneer. He's uh, really a leader. Why? Because he's the one who really uh, express, manifest uh, what is uh, spontaneous healing or spontaneous uh, remission. That was uh, years ago uh, with Dr. Chopra, what uh, shocked the whole world with his book of quantum healing when he come with this, uh, you know, uh, phenomena of uh, uh, spontaneous healing. And later on, Dr. Goswami had a little bit more to the understanding. But here, uh, it's more than this, you know. I was, uh, had the privilege to, was to be on his uh, workshop a few weeks ago and it, it's very insp uh, impressive. The spontaneous healing is no more something unfamiliar. It's something that uh, happened. And uh, he has, uh, in some way, uh, demonstrated this. And not only that, you have to know that uh, behind this, there is a, a, a scientific research back, uh, back up by Harvard, Yale, and Stanford University. And, and not only that, uh, Dr. Paul is known uh, worldwide now because he has been uh, invited at CNN, Dr. Oz. Uh, he was also uh, featured in the Living Matrix and he's also uh, uh, was uh, discussed at the, in the New York Times. So uh, it's my pleasure to have you on board, uh, Dr. Dr. Pearl. And uh, uh, something uh, really, uh, you know, uh, one question I have in mind is, I know you, you were in the, uh, a chiropractor, and what is, how do you can relate the field of uh, chiropractic, and where were you at, uh, what, uh, what was at the origin, your interest in chiropractic, because now it seems you were some way far from this, uh, this field now. So can you tell us some more about that? Well, I had, I really had, no understanding of where I wanted to go in my professional career. After I left high school, I did my undergraduate at uh, several different universities, changed my uh, majors a few times. And then I was introduced to a chiropractor who introduced me to the pure original chiropractor. Now, I'm specifying that because there's a distinction between the pure, original, what you call principled or philosophic chiropractic and the chiropractic that the majority of chiropractic doctors out there do. The majority of them, maybe about 65, 75 percent of them, practice what is called a, a mixing form of chiropractic, which is pain and symptom based. But pure original chiropractic had nothing, nothing to do with symptoms. What happened was the first chiropractic patient was deaf. And the discoverer of chiropractic, Dr. Judy Palmer, found a bone out of place in their spine, adjusted the bone back into position, and this person regained their hearing. So everyone thought, hmm, chiropractic, a cure for deafness. They put out the call all over North America, and the deaf people were coming in from north, south, east, west, horses, covered wagons. And <laughs> as the story goes, Dr. Palmer was popping their neck and popping their back, and some of them were regaining their hearing, and some of them were losing their hearing. But the reality is, they were healing from many very different things. And that was the beginning line when the discovery of what real chiropractic is came about. And in essence, to understand that, we have to understand, you know, we think if someone says to us, where is our brain, we think our brain is in our head. But it's not, if we really think about it. The brain is in the head here, but then it changes shape. It becomes the brain stem. It changes shape. It becomes the spinal cord. It changes shape. It becomes nerve roots and nerves and nerve fibers that insert in virtually every single cell in our body. Some people say there are at least... 12 tiny little nerve fibers that insert into every cell in our body. Each cell in our body lives a specified lifespan. You know, some of the cells live 30 days, some 45 days, some 60 days. 
And when there's an interference somewhere in the positioning of the bones in the spine, it somehow affects the nervous transmission of the energy. And that interference causes the cells to replace themselves less than 100% in their function. So areas become sick or dysfunctional. When enough areas become sick or dysfunctional, it changes the entire system. I'll give you an example. I'll give you my example, personally. When I went to school for chiropractic, I had this explained to me and I decided I wanted to go. The simplicity of it was remove the influence, get out of the way, allow the power that made the body to heal the body. So I went to school for chiropractic. It sounded very interesting, although I've never experienced it. And in my first part of the seminar, I mean the semester, in the first part of my semester, uh, first semester there, they said that we, the new students, had to go down and let the graduating students in clinic work on us. And to do that, they wanted us to take off our shirts so that they could better see what's happening with our spine. I didn't want to take off my shirt. The reason I didn't want to take off my shirt was because since I was a teenager, I had a, had a very bad cystic boil-like type acne on my chest, on my back, a little bit on my neck. It was so severe that the only way I could clear it up was to get a sunburn. Not a suntan, a sunburn. And to get a sunburn, I had to go out in the sun, but I wouldn't go out in the sun in public. I wouldn't even take off my t-shirt in my apartment with my roommate. I had to find a part of the roof of the apartment building where I lived where no one was allowed to go, and I would hide there just to burn my skin. So there was no way that I was going to go into that clinic and take my shirt off for other students to work on me. But I was told that I had no choice if I wanted to graduate school. But what the doctor explained to me was that once we remove the interference, the body will begin to balance itself. It might take up to a year, it might take less, because I had had the problem at that point for about a good 10 years. Well, within, and I want you to know that, that I had gone through antibiotics and all sorts of classic um, dermatologic treatment. Nothing had worked. Within the first month, first month, 80% of that cystic boil-like acting was gone. Within the following three months, the remaining 20% of it was gone. Now think of the cycle here. They found vertebra in my spine out of place that affected the nerves going to the liver and kidneys. What, do the livers, what does the liver do? The liver is responsible for handling a lot of the toxins in the body. So when the nerves were out of position, my liver cells were not replacing themselves at 100%, so my liver wasn't doing its job properly. So it kicked out half-baked toxins into my system that my kidney had to deal with. So the kidneys became overworked. They didn't know what to do. They kicked out the toxins into the bloodstream. The bloodstream didn't know what to do with this overload of toxins, so it came out through my skin. So what do we do? We go to a dermatologist who gives us antibiotics. The antibiotics further stresses the liver and the cycle continues. But by removing the interference and getting out of the way, we allow the body to heal itself. So maybe 25 to 35 percent at most of chiropractic doctors out there understand what chiropractic is. It's the same with osteopathy. Not a lot of the osteopaths know what osteopathy is, but it works on a similar principle. Reconnective healing works, oddly enough, interestingly enough, on a similar principle of removing an interference, getting out of the way and allowing the power that made the body to heal the body. But you see, I went into school, and they beat this philosophy out of us. They wanted us to be pseudo-medical doctors, diagnose, find the problem, fix the symptoms, fix where the situation was, do physical therapy, and I did that for the first nine years that I practiced. But somewhere in my ninth year, someone reintroduced me to the truth of the philosophy of chiropractic, and I started, I got rid of my physical therapy units, I started focusing on clear, pure chiropractic, and the level of healings within my patients rose. And somewhere within that third year, after I went back to original chiropractic, so actually it was my 12th year in practice, was when a few strange things started to occur. 
And that was when I discovered reconnective healing. Now, what reconnective healing does and what healing is about is about us learning to vibrate at a higher resonance, a higher level of light. And in doing so, we allow others to vibrate at that higher level of light. And when we vibrate at light, when we vibrate at a level of light, a lot of the densities or the interferences in our system vibrate out of the system. You see, our bodies don't need anything added into it. Our bodies just don't need any interference. Our natural design is to regenerate, reorganize, and to be healthy. Healing is about not adding into the system, but about removing interferences and allowing the body to return to a state of health. Uh, the, the quantum physics uh, or quantum science, this uh, uh, approach of reconnective healing, you know, it seems, uh, you know, both are pretty close together, right? Because uh, quantum physics brings us new principles to understand all this uh, uh, energy, subtle energy uh, functioning. How do you relate uh, reconnective healing with these principles? I'm not sure that I would say that quantum physics brings us new principles. I would say that quantum physics gives us some understanding into the principles that have always existed. You see, we think that things don't exist until science discovers them. The reality is, is that everything exists until science discovers it. If it didn't, science would have nothing to discover. We confuse absence of proof with proof of absence, and they're two completely different things. So people will say to me, is reconnective healing quantum physics based? No, it's not. It's based in truth. It's based in the universal laws. It's based in the universal laws and principles. Quantum physics is one perspective of us beginning to understand those laws. So, for example, it was very common in spiritual practices to talk about being the light. It was always religious, it was spiritual, it was nothing anyone could put their finger on, but it was a beautiful concept. We should all be the light that we are. We now know today from the work of Dr. Carl Perbrum in Germany and from others that the DNA in each of our cells does emit specific levels of light. It is generally accepted that when our health is diminishing, when our health is diminishing, that light is dimming. When our health is coming back up, that light is coming back up. There are now six international studies, some of them have been published, some of them have not yet been published, that demonstrate that the reconnective healing frequencies of energy, light, and information actually affects, restructures, or as I like to say, reconnects our very DNA. What we know is that it raises the light levels that are emitted and it brings about a higher level of coherence of light. So. These are different understandings from quantum physics. Then we extrapolate. We extrapolate from these understandings. We make analogies. We make comparisons. So most of us are watching this interview right now on our computers. So if we look at our computers, what do we see? We see a metal box. By itself, that computer does nothing. That metal box does nothing. We have to install a software program into it. Then we get information out of the computer. And we access information from that internet field out there somewhere. If we upgrade the software into the computer, we get more information from the computer and better access to that internet field out there somewhere. So let's take an analogy. What if our brains are our hardware? What if our DNA is our software? If what these six studies so far have confirmed is accurate, is true, then the interaction with what science today refers to as the reconnective healing spectrum. By changing the DNA, by changing the light emissions coming up from us, is actually bringing about a human software upgrade, which allows better access for each of us to what's within our brains, and better access to what is referred to today as zero point field, that field of information in which we all exist, that field of information which exists within each one of us, 
which we play in naturally as children when you, one child stares at another child who's asleep until they wake up when in the field. When you think about someone you haven't thought about for 15 years and 15 minutes later they call you on the phone, we're in the field. So people who are geniuses, people who are psychics, people who are healers. Just listen a little more up here, a little more down there. The field of infinite potential is what quantum physics talks about all the time. We reduce the concepts of quantum physics according to what we're used to. We reduce the concepts of quantum physics by what Madison Avenue wants when we hire PR people. We talk about quantum medicine is one of the words that we used. And other times you use the word quantum healing. Quantum healing is an appropriate word. Quantum medicine is really a Madison Avenue spin for the sake of medicine. Because when we speak about quantum medicine, we picture medicine as the concept. When we speak about alternative medicine, we picture medicine as the center of it all. When we speak about complementary or integrative medicine, medicine becomes the center of it all. But visualize a diamond. The diamond has many facets to it. There's this facet of the diamond, that facet of the diamond, that facet of the diamond, that facet of the diamond. Is the diamond medicine? Or is the diamond healthcare? Is it quantum medicine? Or is it really quantum healing? Is it complementary medicine? Or is it really complementary healing? Alternative healing? integrative healing. Healing and healthcare is what we are here to recognize as the diamond. One facet of the diamond, just one, is medicine. Another equally beautiful facet of the diamond is dentistry. Another beautifully, equally beautiful facet is chiropractic or acupuncture or homeopathy. The diamond is healthcare and the sooner we start to consciously speak, the sooner we start speaking about complementary, alternative, integrative, and quantum health care, the sooner we'll have a higher consciousness within the field of health care, not just within the field of medicine, and the sooner we'll have a higher level of consciousness within the general community. Yeah, fascinating the way you look at, you look at this, and I'm sure uh, uh, reconnective healing will do, uh, uh, you know, in the future, a very important part in this uh, healthcare system. Uh, it's one facet of the diamond. Absolutely. And now uh, we spoke about, you know, some uh, idea of quantum medicine, quantum physics. What about uh, Chinese uh, acupuncture medicine? You know, the meridian network and reconnective healing, or you know, is there a, any kind of uh, relation you can uh, do with? Your, your approach and uh, this old ancient system of uh, uh, Chinese acupuncture or Taoist medicine? Is there any link? Well, you know, there are energy fields, energy meridians in the communication within our system, and those are some of the ways that our body functions. So the Chinese meridian system has been working with that concept. And the concept's just not only the meridian systems on our body, but these meridian lines extend off of our bodies. They tie us into the ley lines, the grid lines that encircle the planet and the globe. They continue out, tie us into the other stars and the planets, tie us into the dimensions in between, the multiple dimensions on which we exist. You know, just like when, when they discovered the most of an atom was empty space. It wasn't really empty space. It's, it, it's, it's a field of infinite potential, infinite communication and possibility. So are these systems, and some parts of the systems work on meridian lines. Some parts of them work on grid lines that continue out into the universe. Some people will call it cosmic grill or I mean, a cosmic grid. Some will refer to them as axiotonal lines. There are many different words to use for this, even a cosmic lattice. It doesn't matter the terminology. The reality is, though, 
Healing doesn't occur just through these systems. These systems light up and function at a higher level as there is a natural return to balance. So, let me see the best way to explain this. A lot of things change when we work with reconnective healing because we've been used to working with energy and energy systems. And so our energy healing techniques, Reiki, Jirage, and Shin, Shigang, are all different subsets of the energy that we've had here. Everything that we've had here has been energy. We've been existing in a four-dimensional world, height, width, depth, and time, like a bubble or a balloon, and everything inside of that bubble or balloon has been energy. But our balloon of time is expanding. The bubble is becoming thinner, more transparent, more translucent, more permeable, and we're accessing more of what's been outside of our bubble, further away in that universe, outside of energy, into aspects of light and information that haven't been seen here before. So it affects our systems in many ways. It lights up the meridian communication. It spins chakras in appropriate directions. It allows for densities in our energy field to fall away. It allows for colors in the auric field to come back into balance. It allows for kundalini to explode beautifully. And we think, oh, healings come through the kundalini. They come through correcting the chakras. They come through clearing the energy fields or filling in the holes. They come through many things, but those things are just a part of a larger system of healing and of balance. There is a communication throughout the universe. There are communication lines. So they may very well be these extensions or include the extensions of the acupuncture lines, but they're more than just the acupuncture lines that we've had here. The reality is there's much more than we've had here. There's more than we've had ourselves and than we've allowed ourselves to see. But the reason that this is coming about so beautifully is because we are present at this point in our evolution where time is expanding. Time is moving faster in all directions at once. It's opening up. So our little bubble of existence is expanding and opening up. As it becomes larger and larger, imagine blowing up a balloon or blowing air into a bubble. It becomes thinner and thinner and more permeable. So we are now interacting with more of the universe. Well, as it becomes thinner, as it becomes more permeable, as this balloon of time changes that way, it is also doing one other thing. It's disappearing. We are stepping in to a period of our evolution where we are allowing ourselves to see that time is an illusion. And as we allow ourselves to see that time is an illusion, it gets thinner and thinner and disappears, then we interact more fully with the multidimensional universe, including accessing parts of us that we allow ourselves to access in between lifetimes when people have what some people refer to as a near-death experience, what others refer to as a life-after-death experience. And it's allowing us to bring that consciousness, that level of existence, here on Earth, in this plane, for us to, to discover that we've never really been existing just on one plane anyway. It's been the one facet of the diamond of our existence that we've allowed ourselves to see. So we talk about, for instance, past lives and past life regression, when we're actually discovering that there's no such thing as a past life. It's simultaneous lives. There's a no deja vu. It's all simul vu. People come up to me all the time and they'll say, oh, I'm a Pleiadian just like you, or I'm from Sirius, I'm from here, I'm from there. And the reality is we are all of these things at once. We're Pleiadians and we're New Jerseyans simultaneously, but we're learning to recognize this. Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing you uh, here. It's like uh, uh, with reconnective healing, we can speak about awakening. This is what you are speaking about here. It's like people will go to a new, being, uh, being have re release of some blockage. There is uh, a new 
kind of uh, energy light that flow and then an awakening that come with it and and then uh, that probably is also as is it also associated to higher degree of integration and, and, and my question here I'm thinking about you know Deepak Chopra what what do you mean by awakening awakening of what you know I'm thinking about here uh, okay Deepak Chopra years ago came with this idea of perfect health and everybody get confused here you know what what what's perfect health and then Dr. Goswami uh, introduced the idea of uh, positive health which is more kind of a state of higher integration and and I'm listening at you and it's like uh, yes it's like you reconnect you know you breathe, breathe in a, a new uh, uh, more flow of energy and then from there you, you, you perceive the world of reality differently so this is what I'm speaking about awakening. Is is it associated with reconnective healing a higher level uh, of integration, uh, a level a higher the level of uh, you know health? How do you see health at the end of this? Yes. An awakening. Absolutely. We wake up, we go to sleep a little. We wake up, we go to sleep a little. Deepak Chopra's book that you're referencing was called Quantum Healing. You know, uh, medicine tried to turn it into quantum medicine, as we talked about earlier. Mm. Um, and then we start to wake up again and we say, wait a minute, quantum medicine doesn't work. Quantum healing works. We wake up to recognize that, wait a minute, I'm not just existing on one dimension. I'm existing on many dimensions at once. And as we allow ourselves to become multidimensional, as time disappears, we don't have to wait for the healing process any longer, for example. How long does it really take for a healing? But when you witness reconnective healing, they tend to be fairly instantaneous, and they tend to be lifelong. Healing does take this long. So why, for some people, does healing take longer? Because it has to do with how much we are still living in the illusion of time and then within that illusion, we say, well, the healing needs to take this much time, so we build an expectation to it. But as we wake up, we discover the beauty and the wonders of the world. We move from a state of expectation, which requires and expects things from people and situations. And we wake up into a more childlike existence of joyous expectancy, not expectation where this has to fit this and this has to match that, but a childlike expectancy to, oh wow, something wonderful. And within that opening, the gifts of the universe flows through us. Now, some people were having this all along. They would go in, they would go into a doctor, some people would get the diagnosis of cancer and they'd be dead within three weeks to a month. Other people would get the diagnosis of cancer and the cancer would vanish. Medical doctors call this spontaneous remission. They didn't even want to use the word healing. Spontaneous remission. I remember one time I was on the Lisa show, and Lisa was in her, um, well, I'm trying to find a nicer word than sleazy period, and I'm sure you'll all come up with one, when she was doing ambush television. And so during the presentation, all of a sudden a doctor jumped up from the audience with a microphone and in full makeup. So in other words, he was set up to attack an ambush. And he said, haven't you ever heard of spontaneous remission? And I said, sure I have. But isn't it wonderful how many spontaneous remissions take place with reconnective healing? Who really cares? The doctor was focused on who got the credit for the healing. Did medicine get the credit? Did someone else get the credit? Who cares who gets the credit? Really, it's about each and every one of us. We've had an amazing system set up with medicine for a long time. Um, there used to be a time when uh, the American Medical Association was possibly the second largest trade union in the country, and the third largest was American Pharmaceutical, and we had a wonderful system. We would go to the medical doctor, pay the money, take a pill or uh, pay the money, get a prescription. Take the prescription, pay the pharmacy money, get a pill. Take the pill, get sick, go back to the medical doctor who had to give us two new prescriptions, one for what they should have given us in the first place and one to get over the problems of taking the pill, and then go back and pay the pharmacy 
more money to give us something so we can heal from what the pharmacy gave us that made us sick. And then the medical doctors and the pharmacists would all join each other with their families in Bermuda, and we would continue the cycle on and on and on again. So meanwhile, suddenly people are getting healthy from roots outside of medicine. They're getting healthy from acupuncture. They're getting healthy from osteopathy. They're getting healthy from chiropractic. And so medicine tries to sweep people into their field. They swept in the osteopaths, and the osteopaths lost their um, philosophy. They didn't sweep in the chiropractors, so they decided to create a quackery board for anyone who was getting people well. <laughs> Outside of medicine, they became labeled quacks. Instead of medicine learning from them, they were worried about the income. Now, that changed after a while. There was some kicking and screaming going on in the part of medicine, and they had to lose a lot of their um, legal battles in order to get to a point where they understood this differently. But we're at a different consciousness today, and as the expression goes, often progress marches forward one funeral at a time. And as the older, more closed-minded doctors gave us the favor of moving on, newer, younger, more open thinking health practitioners came into the field. And these are the people, thank goodness, who we're taking over today. In Reconnective Healing, for example, I've trained over 100,000 practitioners, and, it's, and a good 20,000 or more are mainstream healthcare practitioners, doctors, nurses, etc. The world is changing this work. Reconnective Healing is in hospitals, it's in private practices. I speak at the United Nations, spoke at Madison Square Garden. It's time for the doctors of the world, whatever field they're in, chiropractic, osteopathy, medicine, dentistry, it's time for us as doctors, I heard the philosopher say once, to stop trying to be the doctor and to start allowing ourselves to be the healers. My belief is that as children, we didn't grow up initially wanting to be doctors. We grew up initially wanting to help people. And then we were told by society that there are certain acceptable ways in which to do this. And we were given options. We weren't allowed to step into becoming the healers that we were, so we had to find socially acceptable delivery paths. And it's time for us to become the healers in whichever delivery path we're using. It doesn't negate the path. I believe that every healthcare discipline has its role. If I walk out into a busy highway and I'm struck by a fast-moving vehicle and there's blood spurting out of my arteries, bones are broken, love reconnective healers, but get out of the way when you hear the siren and ambulance is coming. If I have a fever and an infection raging throughout my body, reconnective healing doesn't help it. Thank God for antibiotics. I will take them. And if the antibiotics aren't working, thank God for reconnective healing. I will take it but I don't want my dentist doing my chiropractic. I don't want my medical doctor doing my osteopathy. I don't want my osteopath doing my brain surgery unless they're trained in brain surgery. The, every healthcare discipline plays a very important role. The only danger, the only danger that comes in is when one healthcare discipline, be it medicine or anything else, considers itself to be the expert over all the others. Uh, oh, by the way, not that I have an opinion on the subject or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I see the time uh, going here, and uh, you, you know, uh, we have participants, and please, I invite you to prepare your question on the chat room. I remind you, you know, to, uh, let to be more on the, on the concept, uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we're not in a situation where we can uh, answer personal uh, requests or, you know, uh, or respond to a specific problem of health. Uh, so uh, we will be pleased to address this question in a in few minutes. But uh, and let's uh, speak about uh, other uh, subject here. How you relate uh, reconnective healing? What principle of reconnective healing make it different from NLP, by example, you know, that is also very popular. Well, it's an entirely different issue. Reconnective healing is very different than virtually any form of healing technique that we have today in the fact that, well, from one 
approach, for example, reconnective healing is pretty much the only thing that does not look for the cause of the problem or try to fix it. If you're a medical doctor, you're probably negligent if you don't diagnose and if you don't treat appropriately according to the diagnosis. The more you quote unquote know about your patient, the better off the patient is according to that approach. We've unfortunately in the energy healing world taken on that kind of a concept where we look for the problems, whether we muscle test, whether we use pendulums, whether we talk to our guides, whether we feel for densities in the field or look for colors or spins out of balance. We try and diagnose a problem. When we try and diagnose the problem, then our mind goes to fix the problem. In reality, in healing, the less we know about the person who comes in, the better off they are because the less likely we are to limit or inhibit the potential outcome of the healing according to what we believe consciously or more insidiously subconsciously the limitations of the potential healing really is. There was a wonderful, wonderful film in um, 1980, I believe, Ellen Burstyn was up for an Academy Award for her role as a healer. And in that film she was about to do a healing on a woman who was unable to walk. And just as she was ready to begin, very friendly, a very friendly country doctor came over, very well-intentioned, calls her aside and tells her, says, don't get your hopes up on this one. Don't expect a lot. I've seen her x-rays. She has total degeneration of her third, fourth, and fifth lumbar spines. Don't get your expectations up high. And Ellen Burson's character responded, well, doc, I have not seen those x-rays, so I'm one step ahead of you. A beautiful insight, a beautiful moment. How this might apply, for example, to NLP is that, well, reconnective healing has nothing to do with hope, with faith, with belief. If I place a book on a table, the table will catch the book, and I can pretty much promise you that the book does not believe in the table. <laughs> but with, with certain things such as NLP or tap, 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 techniques or um, hypnosis, other things, what happens is they intend a specific kind of a change, whether they look for where the cause of the problem is or whether they look for how the, how the symptoms are manifesting, they intend a certain kind of a change. And as long as the belief system maintains, the change stays, stays there. When the change leaves, they give you anchoring and methods, for example, to bring it back and then you can bring it back in for as long as you're able to do that, for as many times as it will hold, for as long as we keep the faith. You know, there's a tendency... The thing with reconnective healing is that the healings tend to be fairly instantaneous, as we mentioned, and they tend to last for a person's lifetime. So think logically. If someone has a healing, someone regains the use of their arm, for example, in reconnective healing, it tends to last for a person's lifetime. So, if you go up and say, now I'm going to reinforce this healing with NLP and give you an anchor, we're communicating many things at once. The first thing we're communicating is that the person hasn't had an abundant healing. So they start expecting it to leave. Is that really a consciousness you want to bring into a healing situation? The second thing is they reinforce that by saying, if it leaves, which translates into the human mind as when it leaves, this is what you can do to fix it. So the person receives less in the full abundance of their healings, and it's reinforced by the authority who's done the healing or the authority of NLP who moves in. Who does this really serve? Well, it serves the ego of the NLP practitioner. And I don't mean to use NLP specifically. We can use NLP as a neutral term for mind over matter, um, hypnotic suggestion, or other kinds of, of attempts to affect something from the outside. And so it serves the purpose of the practitioner, but it really undermines the healing of the person. We have to understand that healings come from one of two places of our consciousness. They either come from fear, lack, limitation, the illusion of separation, the illusion of darkness, or they come from love, prosperity, light, abundance, unity, oneness. And we cannot give a gift we're unwilling to accept or receive ourselves. We cannot stand in fear protecting ourselves in white flames and purple flames and gold flames. 
pulling up imaginary zippers, trying to anchor in healings for fears they may leave, and facilitate healings that reside in abundance and love, us abundantly recognizing that we're ourselves, that we are more than enough by ourselves. The love that lets go of fear. We can't stand in the need for control, doing this technique, that technique, and the other. And stand in the freedom that allows us to be the observer and the observed, the witness and the witness, the seer and the seen. And at some point, we need to acknowledge our fears, the limitations we've believed in, the lack, the need to make ourselves more, which is really us announcing to the universe that we're less than 100%. We need to pick up these fears, these controls, these lacks, these limitations, cradle them, love them, and carry them one step at a time into the light and allow light to do what light does best, which is to show us that the darkness never existed in the first place, that the darkness was merely us not allowing ourselves to shine as the truth and the light of who and what we are. So it's not really a comparison between NLP as much as it is a comparison between the concept of techniques that have, what's the term, built-in obsolescence. You know, you buy a toy, but if it lasts too long, the toy company doesn't make enough money, so they build the toy to only last so long, so you have to buy a new one. Well, in here, in this approach of how to reinforce things, we are often building in the concept that they won't last, and we are taking away the ability of that person to receive the fullness of the gift by telling them to expect it to disappear. Yeah, you know, in, in your explanation, what I'm saying here, uh, it's like we're moving in this uh, model of healing from a more an ego mod uh, referral system where the healer is... Uh, tight control fix from another one where you know you, you have to do nothing the whole thing is is happening by itself so we have to fade the the doctor will become a healer and the healer in the process should just fade and then this is where the whole magic uh, is happening is it we've been used to doing the healings when we do the healings we have to reinforce the healings but when we rise to a level beyond that of technique, we allow ourselves, as we said earlier, to become the witness and the witnessed. As Deepak Chopra says, the observer and the observed, the seer and the seen. And to witness without judgment, to move from trying to create the healing form that we think should happen, that that person thinks should happen, and to step into a place where we recognize that our true highest role is to open a door. Just open the door. It's the other person's responsibility to choose to step through that door. We've been deciding that a healing was good or a healing was bad according to whether or not we got the results we were anticipating. And then we started trying to orchestrate those specific results as if we saw the larger picture. It doesn't feed our ego to open a door and allow the healing to take its natural form, but it gives us the greater gift of witnessing the perfection and the beauty of the intelligence of the universe as it manifests in its elegant simplicity. It's beautiful. Uh, will you say uh, recognitive healing is considered alternative medicine? I know it's kind of a basic question. Now I come back. Why or why not? So... Well, I would start with saying there's no such thing as alternative medicine. Oh, as a matter of fact, I did start by saying that, didn't I? Yeah. Um, when you speak of alternative, you have to say alternative to what? I mean, Western medicine is really an alternative to traditional medicine. So what is alternative to what? So they moved into terms of complementary and then Andrew Weil, I believe, introduced the term integrative. I like integrative medicine, but the approach of integrative medicine or integrative healing, which I would rather say, is that it still feels that we need a lot of different things at once. And sometimes what we really need to do is to step out of the picture 
to witness and observe. So I believe that a lot of what we've been doing has been complementary, alternative, or integrative healing. I believe what we're really doing right now is we're stepping into a more evolved form of healing. I hope to live to see the day where children look at their parents and say, really? Did people really used to swallow all those poisons to try to get healthy? And the mother or father will smile and say, yes, they did. So uh, I can see reconnective healing be on the first line of the healthcare. You know, it's like, you know, you have before, before the client, before the patient, see the doctor, you know, better off to be reconnected. So we will probably uh, s uh, save a lot of energy for trying to fix thing and correct thing and just letting, as you said, you know, getting out of the way and letting, uh, you know, healing happening by itself. Common that will not be the perfect vision, no? Common sense always needs to be employed. The fact is, it would be nice if we allow ourselves to use reconnective healing to give our bodies the chance to heal itself first before we intervene with chemicals and drugs and surgery. And sometimes something is very time pressing and it might not be appropriate to go to that. We might need drugs or surgery first, as an example. Problem is, is that medicine came out with this concept when people would see if they could allow their bodies to find its own healing balance of saying that they were delaying necessary medical care. And in reality, oftentimes, medicine delayed necessary chiropractic or acupuncture or other forms of healing care. So we still have to say, if someone is spurting blood out from an artery, rush them to the hospital. If someone seems to have an imbalance in their health field, let's see if we can bring the balance back first. Personally, I would prefer that before we cut something out of my body or before we put something into my body that has potential undesirable side effects. People will say, you know, well, healing, there's no science to healing. Today, the only intelligent response to that is to say, I'm so sorry you are not up to date on the literature. People will say, well, you know, healing such as reconnective healing can't make any promises or guarantees. And the only real response to that is you're right. Just as with your medical doctor, reconnective healing also cannot make any promises or guarantees. They don't know if you'll get the result you're looking for, if you'll have a different response. They don't know if it'll happen right away or later. They don't know if you'll notice anything at all. The only thing different than with your medical doctor is that they can promise you that there won't be any adverse side effects to the session. Yeah, when I yeah. asked my question, I was thinking more, not in terms of emergen emergency medicine, but more in terms of chronic disease, autoimmune disease, psychosomatic, anything that actually medicine doesn't have a, a real answer. And well, you can't blanket that one field is better than another. Different fields have their strengths in many ways. Yes, if it's not a life-threatening situation, I believe that our highest choice is to step in with healing and offer the body its opportunity to rebalance and heal itself. And if it doesn't take that, then we might need to go to a different approach. But we do need to bear in mind when something may or may not be life-threatening. Thank you, and uh, remind uh, our auditor that uh, Dr. Paul will be with us at the Congress uh, in pretty soon now, from uh, September 30th to October 1, 2, and 3rd. Uh, and of course, you know, he will cover a very other important uh, and interesting subject, and, and uh, one of the signs behind uh, reconnective healing and other matter. And it, that will be also an, absolutely an opportunity to meet him uh, we have also prepared a room where you can experience uh, the, the, 
the technique of uh, or the te this uh, approach of reconnective healing. So we want uh, our Congress to be, uh, you know, not only source of information but experience. And uh, I think at this time we should uh, take some uh, question from our auditor. Uh, can we see the, the chat room here? Uh, so from Manuela here, do healers have to be balanced themselves? I think it's a very interesting question. Do uh, healers have to be balanced themselves? You know, it depends upon your interpretation of the word balance. A lot of times people come in to me and they say, well, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, or I have this problem or that problem. Don't I need to have my own healing first? I have a temperament issue. Don't I need to have my own healing first? I have this going on. I have that going on. Don't I need to have my own healing first? Our healings are returns to balance. It's us returning to balance. Our life is about coming out of balance, returning to balance, coming out of balance, returning to balance. If you shoot a bullet, if you shoot an arrow, if you fly an airplane, it seems to go from point A to point B, but it is off course 90% of the time. It veers left, it corrects itself. It veers right, it corrects itself. It veers left, it veers right. If we focus on the imbalance, we will never find the time for us to facilitate healings because we're waiting for ourselves to be perfectly healed and back in balance. And when that happens, might be the time that we transition this body and go through another lifetime and learn more lessons. Part of our lessons here is to help others. So, obviously, taken to an extreme, if you've got a 107 degree temperature and you're expelling fluids out of every orifice in your body, it might not be the time to perform a healing session on someone. But, generally speaking, if you have difficulty walking, if you've got, you know, rheumatoid arthritis going on in your body, you've got some other problem, unless it's highly communicable, you will always have these situations. It is not your physical body. It is not your physical body. That facilitates the healings. It is your essence, which is always perfect. And in our facilitation of healings for others, we access greater levels of healing for ourselves. And in the greater levels of healing for ourselves that we access, we facilitate greater levels of healings for others. So we are cheating others and cheating ourselves out of our own evolution if we're waiting for the time to be perfect. It's like waiting for the perfect time to get pregnant or the perfect time to get married. If you wait for it, it will never come. If you get married, when you get pregnant, you will find that it is the perfect time. God, love, and the universe has presented you with the perfect child. A lot of wisdom <laughs> here. <laughs> Let's take another question. Uh, from uh, Michael O'Leary. Uh, In reconnective healing, does the person have to know they are being healed or aware of this? Obviously, and conscious adult will know what is happening, but what is about a young child? Another interesting question here. So, how you will answer that? Did you answer uh, here very well, Dr. Pearl? Healing, healing, how can I explain this? Healing is received on a level other than conscious, or sometimes also a conscious level. Offering a healing is something you can do for anyone at any time, whether you're in the same space as them, whether you're in another space as them. It's like offering something sacred, such as a prayer. Offer the healing. If the healing is received, you have been granted permission by the only intelligence that matters. Call it God, love, or the universe. If it's not supposed to be received, I'm sure that wonderful gift will travel somewhere throughout the universe and do something wonderful for someone. Now, does the person need to know? Not necessarily. Might they enjoy knowing and enjoy the experiential aspect of it? That's wonderful. What if they're climbing a mountain? A mountain in the Himalayas. You can't reach them by phone. Do they need to know that you're offering them a healing? No, 
I'm giving you extremes. You have to use your common sense. If you're sitting down in a crowded area and you see a stranger and you don't feel that you or they would be comfortable if you went over and struck up a conversation, but you see that something is going on with them, would you like to offer them a healing in the silence of your own mind in the space that you share with them multidimensionally? It is absolutely perfectly exquisite. Please do so. Thank you. Let's uh, have another question here. Uh, can a healer who is uh, suffering an illness themselves be a healer? I think you already addressed this, but that, maybe you have a... Yeah, no, we should take another question here. How, sure. how you control this healing process if there are negative uh, vibration around the person you are trying to heal? I think this is one that you would like to address here. How you control this healing process if there is negative uh, vibration around the person you are trying to heal? Well, I don't think that the person asking this question is going to love my answer. But there's no such thing as negative vibrations. There, are, There's energy and experiences and vibrations that we might choose to enjoy more or less than something else. But we can't stand in that fear-based consciousness of potential negative vibrations. You know, this is like... Again, we can't give a gift we're unwilling to receive. We cannot stand in fear of negativity, protecting ourselves in flames, shaking off what we think is bad energy into alcohol, spraying ourselves down with salt water, or, or trying to cleanse our energy fields by taking apple cider vinegar baths. We have to recognize that if there's any residue left over on us in the healing process. It's the beauty and perfection of the healing process. If there's any negative energy, it's just a lack of light in that person. And if we stand and impart light, we find that the darkness never really did exist in the first place. It's only where the light didn't shine. If darkness existed, we could sweep it up, put it in a paper bag, and stick it out with the trash. But darkness is an absence of light. It's not a thing. Negativity is an absence of light. It's not a thing. And when we're busy trying to, you know, scrape off the negative energy and spray ourselves down with alcohol after a healing process, we're really forgetting that we've been immersed in the beauty of the healing field. Much like when you climb out of bed from that one special person in your life and you go downstairs quietly while they're still asleep and you reach across the kitchen table for something and you breathe in. When you catch that beautiful scent of them, their skin, their essence still on your skin, and you re-experience that love and that warmth that they evoke in you in your interactions, and tell me, do you really feel like reaching for a bottle of alcohol to spray it away? We have to challenge ourselves to step through our fears and to stop creating or reinforcing fears for others. Negative energy is a... Negative energy fields around some people blocking them is an illusion of us buying into our own fears and projecting them on others. And it's a little frightening to have to step through our fears. But once we do, we step into a place, a space of such ease that we wonder what's taken us so long you know I, I, it's like you know we are in a time now where uh, w what you're doing wasn't available uh, years ago you know because uh, we are uh, uh, as a healer doctor and people uh, that have explored this field of uh, uh, quantum medicine have uh, tried different technique and technology and uh, along the way of course you know we heard about this uh, vibe negative vibe or you know and and but now with you it's like we now we we we're getting in a new uh, awareness about you know uh, what is healing and how powerful it is I, is there uh, is some frequency that are now more available that were not there before or is there a collective consciousness that was that is now here that was not there before you know can you comment about you know, that? There's some, there's some of everything that you said. I mean, 
you know, humanity existed in the Dark Ages. When? In the Dark Ages. What's the Dark Ages? Uh, a period of time before what we accepted as enlightenment. So as we move into a more enlightened arena in the field of healing, we start to look back and go, look, these are this is residue from the darker ages. Not dark meaning bad, but the darker ages meaning the less enlightened ages. Now part of it is that there is more. There is more. It's true. We have been existing in this field, as we spoke about, this little bubble or balloon of energy. And as the balloon has expanded, the walls of time, the, the illusion of time, has become thinner and thinner. And we're accessing more of what's existed outside of that balloon. So it's timeless. It's not old, because it, because it wasn't here before. It wasn't within time. It's timeless. It existed outside of the balloon. But it's entering in here now new, expanded levels of light, expanded levels of information. And it's challenging us to step into expanded vibrations of light, of the truth that we are. So we are really being challenged to see truth in a more expanded way, to become truth in a more expanded way. When we do energy healing techniques, we try to do the technique, do this, do that, step A, step B, do this more complicated level, do this, do that. And now what we're being challenged to do is to stop doing, stop doing and instead to become the healing, to become the light. Just as when you take a lit candle, to light another candle, to light another candle, the flame doesn't do a technique, the flame doesn't protect itself, the flame doesn't worry that the other candle is too dark or has negative energy about it. The flame simply stands in the perfection, the beauty, the essence, the truth of who, it, what it, and, of who and what it is, and by doing so it inspires the flame and the next candle to ignite and the next flame and the next, and we are being challenged to be candles, to be really the flames of the candles. We are exchanging bio photons with one another, and as our consciousness, as our consciousness raises, the coherence and the light levels of our bio photons raise, and we serve as reminders or inspirations to others of their light vibration, where their densities fall away be they physical, be they mental, be they emotional, be they spiritual, be they relationship-wise, be they career-wise, be they fear-based-wise. And this is part of what comes about just from these conversations, just from the sharing. It allows for different people at different points in time to hear different words, to hear different thoughts at different moments, and go, I get it. It's my turn. I just woke up. I think I'll wake up my neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let's uh, take another question here, and uh, and you can realize you know how uh, you know exciting are these conversations. I'm sure at the, at the end of this hour you will not uh, have enough of <laughs> Dr. Pearl. So which is the next oh, one? Next kind of too much of me. Oh, oh, too much. I don't know. <laughs> not for me. You know, I heard you uh, you know weekend and I. You know, I can I can hear you uh, very long for days. Mary Mary Rose, why sometimes work and sometimes don't? And this is another very good question here. Why sometimes work and sometimes don't? And I think you have spoke a little bit about it, but you can you. Yeah. I, th I think we did. Healings always work. It's just that we judge them on whether or not they bring about the results that we desired, that we anticipated. So it's actually for our own growth as witnesses, as well as for the growth of the person experiencing the healing, to say, maybe I didn't receive the healing I was looking for. Where is the healing in that? Maybe I received something else. Where is the healing in that? I've heard it say, some people say, some of us may need our illnesses, our health challenges, to give love, some to get love. Some say we take on our health challenges for our own lessons. Yet if we really look at the larger picture, we see that we take on our health challenges also for the lessons of those close to us in our lives. And the universe, God, the power of love knows 
our perfect life course when it's appropriate to release something and when it isn't. And that brings us back once again saying, can we see the wisdom and the perfection in opening the door and allowing the other person to choose to step through that door? Because when we push them through that door, we cheat them out of the courage. Well, we teach that we cheat them out of the gift the, of the insight that comes from making their own choice. We cheat them out of the benefit of them being brave enough to step through their fears and make that choice. We cheat ourselves out of being able to witness the perfection of the healing. And you see, if as we witness, our knowingness becomes enhanced. As our knowingness becomes enhanced, we allow ourselves to see and witness more. As we allow ourselves to see and witness more, we step into greater levels of knowingness, and this expanded knowingness carries itself into the next healing and the next healing and the next healing. So it's a cycling up, an expansion that comes from this. And the first step is in learning not to judge the healing based on the results. Not to judge the healing or decide whether or not it worked, but to step back three feet and say, well, I didn't see the healing in this specific instance, but maybe there's a greater thing for me to witness. It's a learning for us to leave the result orientation and to step into allowing ourselves to experience the process. You know, it, it used to be that most people would take a job for the money, a result orientation. Now and now, more and more people are becoming more conscious and they're taking the career choice that allows their heart to sing. They're leaving result orientation behind, stepping into the beauty and the perfection of the process and finding that the result includes rewards greater than they would have anticipated. It's our same responsibility in the healing world to step out of the focus on results and to step into having a focus on the process of being the healing practitioner, the process of opening the door. Yeah, for me, yeah, it's, for me. It's, it resonates like passion, you know, to be in the passion of what you are doing too. Uh, let's take another question here. So, which is the next one? Uh, Michael Leary, it's a beautiful, it is beautiful that we are simple door opener. I really like that. It makes healing a more personal matter of choice. I think it's more statement, so let's take a question here. Uh, which one? Manuela, how far has science come in uncovering what uh, reconnective healing is? So uh, I'm sure Dr. Pearl will, uh, the Congress, cover very deeply this subject, but maybe you can say a few, yeah, a little I about it here. Yeah, I think we'll step into the science of it more during the conference itself. If I just touch on some high points, the original studies um, started taking place at the University of Miami and Jackson Memorial Hospital and at the University of Arizona. University of Arizona was when they demonstrated the existence of reconnective healing, when they showed that the practitioner's heart waves shows up in the other person's brain waves, show that it was detectable by blindfolded students in darkened rooms. Um, later on, studies measured gamma waves. Um, they measured different mechanisms in it. We've done some iterative studies working with some varied groups of people with different healing problems. We've done studies where we've um, severed leaves from plants and normal leaves would last a few days, leaves receiving energy healing forms, Reiki and Qigong, etc., would last up to seven to nine days. Those receiving reconnective healing frequencies 
would last 70 to 90 days, 70 to 90 days totally severed from the plant itself. They've done studies on DNA damaging it, having it re-heal from the damage inflicting inflicted in it and having it heal from pre-existing damage. There's a lot of studies. Instead of going into it here, let me suggest that you look at a book that where they've compiled just a few of the studies on reconnective healing, which you can actually get on Amazon.com. I'm not the author of the book. It's authored or put together, compiled by Dr. Konstantin Korotkov in Russia at the University of St. Petersburg. His name is spelled Konstantin with a K, K-O-N-S-T-A-N-T-I-N, Karatkov with a K, K-O-R-O-T-K-O-V. And the book is called, easily enough to remember, Science Confirms Reconnective Healing. Thank you. And uh, again, I remind uh, be, uh, the participant that at the Congress we will have also Dr. Dispenza, Dr. Fanning, uh, uh, s specialist in the brain mapping, and so we will go uh, cover in depth, you know, all the science which is behind uh, quantum healing. And As a matter of fact, the conference is also going to have Lynn McTaggart. And the gift of having Lynn McTaggart at your conference is that she has taken the time as a journalist, as a layperson, not as a researcher, but to understand the many, many, many different um, discoveries in quantum physics and she has gotten the researchers to translate it from the lion from the science of from the language of science to the language of English thank God so we the lay people can understand the research that's going on so it, it's for me it's, it's a very uh, historic moment because you know years ago uh, we were speaking about this phenomenon now and, and all the time challenge, you know, by, as you said, people who are not uh, really updated in science and they will say, you know, there is uh, how this works, it's not scientific. Now we are, we are reaching this time where it's not an isolated phenomenon, but, you know, a lot of science research has been done and, and uh, can give a, an answer that, uh, you know, can convince a, a medical society. So, and this is why we thought that this Congress uh, this year is, is very uh, an important one. And the idea to have Dr. Pearl and Dr. Dispenza, Lynn McTaggart, and Dr. Fanning, and Dr. Goswami uh, all together uh, was uh, really uh, for us <laughs> a, real, uh, a, a real moment in time. So uh, if you cannot, c I know there is just a few days now left, a week, still time to book a flight if you cannot. Uh, the, the event will also be available online and uh, please uh, just go on our uh, website or we have also sending email uh, so you can still register for this uh, unique event. Uh, let's take another question here. Uh, do natural phenomena, and this is for Manuela, do uh, natural phenomena such as solar flare and storms, full moon, etc., affect our uh, healing ability? Interesting question. I love that question because, you know, with reconnect healing, it's, it, people's bodies almost every time, it's not, it's not like doing some energy healing where people feel warm or they're relaxed or they have an occasional jerk or maybe their eyes roll a little bit back and forth. Reconnective healing, the fingers often continuously move like art or an arm will jerk, a leg will jerk, the head will rock, lips will part, tongue will move, tiny little involuntary muscles will ripple in the forehead and the chin, pull up their lips, their ears, their eyebrows, but during a heavy rainstorm or a storm with lightning and thunder. Wow, these movements phenomenally increase. It's just it just fascinates me. I look forward to doing healing sessions and hearing the thunder lightning, feeling the wind, feeling the rain. Is it the negative ions? Is it the electric charge? Is it a an enhanced communication? It's all it's all of this, but it's really 
really, really, to use an unscientific word, it's a thrill. Yeah, and welcome to Hawaii, the paradise, you know, I'm sure here the energy for <laughs> for this uh, phenomenon express uh, probably optimum, and uh, actually I wish you a rainbow <laughs> when you are giving your conference, so. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you something else very interesting. When I give the seminars, when there's a point of intensity, oftentimes, strange electrical phenomena take place. I uh, gave one a few weeks ago, and I was making a point, and the point reached a crescendo. It was so strong, and at that moment, at that very moment, there were like, I forget, three, six, I don't know, light bulbs burst from the ceiling in this hotel um, ballroom went to the ground with it looking like looking like um, looking like uh, what do you a shooting star looking like shooting stars went in between each and every person didn't hit any person but melted the carpet on the floor the following week I went to, I was in Germany a week or two later I was in Germany gave a presentation to about 75 people in mainstream media it was the first time, first time mainstream media decided to open up to the potential of healing. And we had about 75 of the top people in all of German mainstream media. And someone asked a question and was just, this can't be real. Something like that was just so opposed to it. And at that moment in this building where many of them worked and resided and every day for how many years the lights start turning off and on and off and on and off and on and you could hear the people <gasps> and gasp <laughs> you could hear them gasp. and then it went on and someone else raised another point and started to get a little fidgety about it and boom the lights hit again and they went on and off only over his head nowhere else in the rest of the room that was all in the same circuitry. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't fascinating. know what it means, but I don't know what it means, but uh, it, it was cool. You know, it was just cool. Fascinating. I, and I can, uh, I can uh, uh, say that when I was in Sacramento, this, uh, the ball falling from the, the, the ceiling uh, so happened there. So, but, you know, I like to reassure the participant, you know, you don't need to bring a helmet because, uh, no. you know, nobody never get hurt, right? No, this is healing with intelligence. And I believe this is the universe watching us with love and care and intelligence. This is very, very important. You know, if you talk to people, if you talk to people who've had a life after death experience or what some people like to call a near-death experience, you find that they often report that on their way of moving towards that bright light that they all see, that we all come from, we all return to, they see all these people, all their relatives who have moved on, many different people who have played different roles in this life, they suddenly realize they've played roles in other lives, and they're all encouraging them, pointing the way towards the light, guiding them, encouraging with that movement. It's sort of like when we go um, to a race. Maybe there's been like a marathon race and everyone's standing at the last 50 yards, you know, encouraging the runners. No one's taking over for the runners. The runners have to complete the race themselves, but they're there giving their encouragement. Well, I believe that humanity is on this precipice of evolution. Everyone in the universe is evolving, but this facet, we'll go back to the analogy of the facet in the diamond, so the diamond of existence, the human facet right now, and it is on its next level, level of evolution, maybe to step into another facet, another dimension, I don't know what it is, but I think that everyone else in the universe knows that it's humanity's turn. And the universe is here 
watching us, supporting us. It's letting us know that it's here by playing with the lights, by playing with different things, by bringing about these phenomena at important points in time. It's not going to finish the race for us. We still have to do it. But it's encouraging us, saying, you've made a point, flash the light. We're here. We're watching. We're with you. Because it's important to the rest of the universe that we evolve so that the universe can continue with its evolution. Yeah, it's uh, for me also kind of a synchronicity event. God likes to, uh, I don't know if we say this in English, uh, blink and a uh, clean d'oeil. How do you say that? Uh, I blink, you know, saying, oh, yeah, it's okay. You are going in the right direction here. And, uh, he, and with a sense of humor, too, you know, this is uh, what, uh, you know, remind you your stories. So let's uh, have another question here. Uh, Gina, Dr. Pearl, and thank you for this time you are so graciously sharing with us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Do you believe the healer needs to ground themselves before they request a healing or a prayer of healing? Thank you. I think this is one of, uh, of the usual questions you have uh, that you answer. Ground yourself how? Have we ever really lost our grounding? And do we really need to ground ourselves from when we're high and floating and vibrating? Won't we ground out all too soon anyway? I think as long as we allow ourselves to be aware and loving from a detached, caring position, we are grounded. I don't think that there's anything special that we need to do. I think more we need to be and share who we are. We need to feel the love for the other person, not in the emotional way that has us feel their pain or feel their tears, but love them enough that we are willing to rise above to observe and to witness to recognize that we are not doing the healings. We're not even merely a conduit for the healing, but we, in our very preparing a catalyst for the healing. And as a catalyst for the healing, we go through our own transformation as they do. I don't think we need to do anything to ground ourselves. I'm not sure I like the concept of the word ground. I, I kind of like us being where we are during the healing process. I don't know. That's my take on it. And this is what I uh, generally understand here. It's like we have to move on now in a space where, you know, we have to, the healer has to fade uh, with his fear and control and trying to fix and, and protection. And, and this is a subject that, of course, you will go a little bit deeper in other training, too. So uh, le let's move on now and take a, another question. You know, you know, you know there, there, there's just an example that that brought to mind is Sometimes you hear people speak about astral travel, and they say, hold on to the silver cord. The silver cord might break, you might never return, someone will come in, be a walk-in, and take over your body. These are examples of the type of fear-based illusions that we're here to really learn to transcend. Anyway, I'm sorry, let's continue on with your next question. No, that, that's a, it's a very a nice, uh, very good observation. So here another question, uh, which one? Lise, very much appreciate and understand this approach. I've been practicing this for years. How, ca how can reconnective healing help people living with Alzheimer? Uh, you know, we, we can address a uh, you know, problem like this, but we like to stay away from, uh, you know, treatment and personal situation. But do you want to answer this one or? I'll tell you how I'll answer this. I'll answer it without addressing Alzheimer's specifically. Howsoever, if the person is really listening to how I answer this, they will have their answer. It is not the health challenge that has the healing. It's the person themselves. 
So three people can come in with the same diagnosis and the same set of symptoms and receive the same set of results. I'm sorry. Three people can come in with the same diagnosis, the same set of symptoms, and receive three different sets of results, depending on what is appropriate for each person on their life course. We have to realize, just like people say, oh, I don't want to do a healing without getting your permission, you can't adversely affect anyone with the healing. You cannot inflict a healing upon someone. All you can do is offer it up. The worst that could happen, the worst that could happen is nothing. The most that could happen is everything. But it does depend on what is appropriate for that person on their life course at that moment in time. And when we don't allow ourselves to understand that, that's our first step into thinking that a healing has failed. And the moment we start to believe that a healing has failed, we start to take on feelings of guilt or responsibilities if we've done something wrong, which then turns itself into us becoming invested in trying to do other things to make something right because we don't want ourselves to be wrong. We don't want to view ourselves as a failure. So we continue trying to make it right, trying to make it right, trying to make it right, and we find that with each time we do that, we step into the trying, we move that much further away from allowing, and healing comes from an allowing. It's an allowance of transformation, a willingness to observe. It's a following, it's an experience. It has nothing to do with pushing or trying or forcing it has to do with being and witnessing. Being surrounding to you will, will you say? Surround to something greater. Surrender. 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 Yeah. I don't love that word because it almost sounds like there was a fight and someone had to give up. <laughs> <laughs> but in the sense that you mean it, I think it's fun. Okay. There is a, Dr. Goswami come out of them with this question, you know, who choose? It's kind of an existential question. And most of the time from our frame of, you know, looking or answering, we all the time try to think in terms of, again, uh, ego referral, you know, I, I choose, I. And here, you know, when he, he go to the explanation of this, it's more, you know, the one who chooses the self. A and... Uh, you know what you're speaking about it's not uh, i'm uh, i'm seeing some kind of correlation here because you know we are all the time expecting a, a result we're judging but from a higher you know what you call the observer there's the self this is the one that will probably uh let unfold what has really to happen and we have to to let go to this you know does it make sense to you or this is the way he, he i like the way he approached this because saying you know, because people, most of them say, oh, yes, we create or you, we are a reality. You have this kind of problem because, you know, the result of I, I have done. But, you know, he brought this dimension that, no, the one who chose is, is broader than that, is deeper than that's that. The, it's, that's, that's and then when we're in, in the process to restoring thing, we have also to term in, think in terms of that self-referral system, you know, where... You know, uh, anything from the sphere of infinite possibility, thing happens from the self point of view, not from the ego point of view. And this is what yeah. is hard here, to shift from one way linear thinking to a multidimensional model of thinking. Amit Goswami is, is, is exquisitely beautiful in his simplicity and his insight. Um, we have schools of thought in the healing field that reinforce guilt and blame. It's very, 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 very common to overhear people saying, oh, I knew she was going to get cancer. She had all that repressed anger. Well, of course, it was only a matter of time. You know, uh, oh, throat cancer because she didn't say this to so-and-so. You know... Is she just needs to choose to get well. Well, guess what? It's not a conscious choice. 
I believe that if there were a pill placed in the middle of a room for a crowd that says, swallow this pill, you'll be well and balanced, most of the crowd would develop concussions, diving for it, hitting their heads against one another. But <laughs> choice takes place really on a higher level. Choice takes place on a level other than the limited conscious human educated mind. And therefore, we might be choosing on a higher level that sees another picture that says, I don't choose to let go of this yet fully because I know that part of the greater path here is for me to be of assistance to my husband or wife, my child, my parent in allowing them to gain certain lessons that I agreed to participate in this with them in this form before I came here to Earth. We don't know. Well, it's just an example. We don't know why certain choices are made, but they're not made on the limited conscious level where we only see what's surrounding us in this plane. And so what the healing world does is it inflicts guilt on those who are already going through health problems and we really need to rise above that. You know, we do something else that's, that's um, not the same thing. I, I don't know exactly what it reminded me of this too, but we, 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 this does have to do with choice. It has to do with us pretending that we're not making choices. And um, the example that just came to mind was overhearing two people involved in the healing world have a conversation where one says to the other, oh, when I worked on Joe Smith, his energy was so low that I was depressed for days. The other one said, oh, I worked on him, and you're right. His energy was so low that I became depressed too, and I got a headache. Well, the other one said, I became depressed too, and I got a headache, and my stomach was upset. And the first one says, well, you know, I was depressed and got a headache. My stomach was upset, but I didn't want to tell you because it gave me diarrhea. And the other one said, well, it gave me diarrhea too, but it also made me throw up. And the other one said, well, mine was projectile. And we play the game, who can get sicker, which really translates into who can pretend to get sicker. Because we all walk around and say, well, I am so real that I became sick. What healer becomes sick? But we take it on because we get to pretend that if we get sick, no one, we think that no one would think that anyone would want to get sick to be a healer. So we're doing it to prove to ourselves that we're real and or we're doing it to prove to the or pretend to prove to the outside world that we are real and the reality is at this level of healing if we allow ourselves to vibrate as the truth of the light that we are we won't take anything on because light cannot take on darkness so we've got two ways of moving through it when people come to me and they say oh i'm so sensitive i can't walk through a shopping mall you know well then you're at effect you're not a cause you're not a healer be a healer it won't bother you you can walk through a shopping mall i'm so sensitive when i do healings i get sick so here's how you can let go of taking things on and getting sick a step one and if you're really good step one will be enough step one is remind yourself that you are the light and, when you, and that you don't need to take something on any longer, and you won't. That's if you've been taking things on subconsciously. But if on some level you've also been taking things on to convince others that you're the real deal, that won't work. So here's what will work. Promise yourself that you will never. And I mean never. I don't mean not for 10 days or two weeks to test it out. I don't mean for 20 years to test it out with delayed gratification. I mean promise yourself that you will absolutely never, ever, ever share with another soul that you took on something negative when you did a healing process. And you will stop taking it on because it will no longer serve a function because there will be no longer any reinforcement because your reinforcement is coming from sharing that with other people. Thank you for Thank you your, for your enlightening, enlightening answer. And, and more here, you it's like uh, more I feel free. <laughs> it's free, uh, it's free the, the practitioner or the healer, or they'll call it the way you want, the doctor from all these uh, fear to, you know, when uh, you are a medical doctor, you go 
in the hospital, the fear to get germs, and then now you are an energetic doctor, then it's feel to get other kind of uh, dirty energy. And so, and, and here what you said is like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it inspired me to, uh, you know, to this gift of, uh, you know, uh, at the same time of uh, love, unconditional and free and, you know, that, that this is very inspiring. Let's take uh, other question here, and uh, again, you know, coming to the the World Congress uh, and be uh, now we are on the World TV, but the be on on the uh, you know around Dr. Paul is also a very uh, touching experience. So Florence, uh, here people have been conditioned to take something for their con. Oops, another one, Alexi. Okay, something for their condition. So how do we bridge that? mind set up. People have been conditioned to take something. Now I should probably refer to uh, vitamin products for their condition. So how do we bridge that mindset? Not a good question here. I'd really like more specifics than what she's talking about before I approach that. Are we talking about drugs? Are we talking about vitamin supplements are we talking about simply eating well and then what does really eating well mean because you know two nutritionists three opinions you <laughs> never really know what's going on you know you know the, the vegetarians um, often bring forward where they talk about research studies that show that vegetarianism is a natural diet and yet uh, most people in science point to comparative anatomy and comparative dentistry to demonstrate that every other animal with our uh, comparative anatomy relationship and our comparative dentistry relationship eats a two-thirds carnivorous diet. So by going vegetarian, we're going against our natural design. And then who is right? What studies are accurate when most studies, you know, Marilyn Schlitz from um, IONS and, and others will tell you that the same study, the very, very, very same study can be done in the very same format with the very same controls by two very highly competent researchers. And the one who believes result A will come about instead of result B will get result A and the other will get result B. So it's, it's, it's a difficult it's a difficult topic to discuss. I will remember, just to piss off a few people, I will remember when I used to um, have a very uh, strong, what can I call it, nutritional practice when I first started in chiropractic. And I decided to write a column. I was off asked and I agreed to write a column on nutrition and people would write in and I'd give answers. And one of them wrote in and said, um, my friend is in the hospital and the food is so terrible. They serve him this, they serve him that. They do. He would get more nutrition if he just ate the cardboard containers that it came in. Who designs this stuff anyway? It said it was a dietitian. I thought nutritionist design thing. What's the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian? And I said the dietitian is the person who did, who determines what goes into your body's mouth. The nutritionist is the person who determines what goes into your body's cells. In other words, the dietitian calculates how many pounds of glazed donuts it would take to feed 375 school children, and the nutrition tells them not to eat them. <laughs> I've got a few letters. Okay, so I guess there's many angles to that question, and... Uh... Who, who was the question, I see? We'll move on to another one. But it did give us something fun to talk about for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. And and please come uh, to the Congress to ask, uh, you know, about vitamins, supplement, uh, and anything, you know. Uh, Monica here. Can reconnecting healing for uh, healing for simple things? My friend, again, here is maybe too personal. <coughs> Uh, no, but she had uh, very lately. Or in the, no, the, I think uh, we we said we will avoid this kind of question, you know, because it's too. It's because too it's actually it's actually already been answered now, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, one here, which is a bit more uh, esoteric, 
and I don't think we can do the whole program before without. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah, does reconnective healing access the Akashic record in the healing process, the virtual library uh, regrouping uh, earth, uh, earth history? Akashic record. You, you know, probably heard we about speak that, about. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. We speak about the Akashic records, we speak about this field, that field, the other field. There are different names, there are different interpretations. It accesses our multidimensional existence, which in course, which of course includes that endless limited limit that endless limitless field of information, zero point field, of which the Akashic Records is simply a part so we don't have to focus in does it work through this does it work through that does it work through the others that's like saying does it work by redirecting the chakra spin does it work by making um, the colors in the field change does it work by this is reconnective healing is so expansive that these things seem to fall together they they all seem to fall together and does it access the Akashic Records, well, you can't access the fullness of the field without accessing the Akashic Records if there are Akashic Records. Yeah, very good. Uh... Of course, it's Akashic 45s and Akashic 33 and the thirds, and now there's Akashic CDs, so you never know where you're going. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we have to make a uh, thing uh, as simple as it could be too, and this, this is what I found when I uh, I was in the, at your workshop. You know, uh, we can make it very complicated, and you know, with all kind of layers of information and very tricky. But uh, in some way, uh, reconnective healing is simple. Will you say that, or it's not that complicated? It's like to be in touch with this uh, new field of information and uh, and learn how. The whole thing about it is its simplicity and its elegance. Is that, you, you know, we have been approaching healing through complex techniques and fear based rituals. And these have been like training wheels on a bicycle. They've been a beautiful way to discover our balance so that we can ride the bicycle. But once you master the bicycle with training wheels, do you really want to add a second or a third or a fourth set? Of course not. You'll never get the gift of the training wheels until you remove them because the gift is not mastering the bicycle with training wheels the gift is mastering the bicycle do we really want to master this healing technique and that technique and that other technique because they've been our training wheels to help us discover our balance in the healing field but is our purpose in the healing field to master multiple techniques even though it might feed our egos with all those certificates we get to hang on our walls or is our purpose to master healing itself the teachers tell us to learn technique after technique after technique and the masters explain to us that the true gift of the technique comes only in their transcendence. Very nice uh, answer. Let's see now what we have left in our question. Can you bring back the okay? Uh, you know, a, a number of things realized we'll go into in more detail during our presentations during the the courses and and whatever we're doing. But right now, I, I want to just touch on these to give us an overall understanding of the concept of, of the philosophy of how to evolve to a new level. So um, when we get into them more in person and we, we can go into them in more depth and we've got time for question and answer depending on how the setup is in, in more detail than that in person, I, I think we'll find greater understanding. But Right now, sometimes it's enough for us to touch on a concept so we can sit with it long enough to decide whether or not we want to go into it further at a later point. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you here. I think we have covered, uh, you know, this intention very well, uh, you know, with the, the last uh, two hours. And uh, fortunately, you know, we cannot uh, go in all the 
the detail of the question, but you are invited again to uh, to be on board at the at the World Congress in Hawaii. You cannot, if you cannot fly in, then uh, uh, you will. We will have uh, we will have the uh, event uh, broadcast, and and, uh, and Dr. Pearl also is planning uh, to have all over the world other. A workshop where you can also meet him, and uh, we are planning to see to do a course uh, at the Quantum University with uh, Dr. Pearl, uh, where we will go in detail to all the layers and the angle of uh, what is uh, reconnective healing. Uh, thank you very much uh, this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening <laughs> to be with us. Uh, this is for me a very uh, uh, a high privilege. Uh, to be uh, in your presence and, and listening your your wisdom, uh, because you are on the one that is, n you know, uh, Einstein said uh, one day, you know, it's not just to know about the field, but if what you do about it, well, how you relate with it, a and the way you do it, you do it with a, a, a lot of uh, grace and sp and perspective and dignity and and uh, and we are, it's it's beautiful to see. Uh, and witness all your work and how you make this uh, quantum medicine, uh, if it, this word is correct now, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, moving forward in our society. And this is very important now. I think at the end of the day is, uh, you know, how people, society will be changed by this new perspective of healing, how many people uh, will be, could be helped, and, uh, and how we can transform our healthcare, uh, bringing in this new, uh, vision, this new experience of reality. So again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pearl, uh, to be with us, and uh, I can't wait to see you in Hawaii. Wish again a rainbow when you will speak, and uh, don't worry, you know, you don't need any helmet, you know, <laughs> nature, where universe works in a way that uh, nobody will be, uh, you will just be uh, uh, impressed and uh, hot in, in, the, in the conference. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pearl. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, uh, to have been with us this uh, today. Uh, and uh, we will see you in the next uh, QuantumWorld.tv. Thank you very much.